Well, thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you, Yushim, and thank you to our two panelists. Uh, we, I think that, that was, that's a great panel to um, lead into the final panel of the day. Um, and we're very fortunate to have with us um, three individuals who are playing important roles in local government. And uh, I wanna start with uh, just a brief sort of um, comment on, on, on this final panel. It's gonna look a, a little bit different from the rest of the panels that we're really, um, we're giving time for the panelists to provide some opening remarks. And afterward, we're hoping to engage in more of um, an unstructured, if you will, discussion, not just between the panelists, but we also in, invite anyone from the audience to engage um, so that we can sort of, you know, wrap every, tie everything together and also keep this uh, local governance lens uh, in place. So I wanna start with uh, Joshua Edmonds. Joshua Edmonds is with the city of Detroit and Joshua is the director of digital inclusion. Um, after Mr. Edmonds, we will have Ms. Zenia Hernandez from St. Paul Public Library. And we also have with us uh, Christine McKay from the city of Phoenix. She, uh, Ms. McKay is the director of economic development. So we'll go ahead and begin with, um, with Mr. Edmonds and then, and then we'll move on from there. Well, thank you for the, uh, the, the time and uh, everyone who's tuning in. Uh, you know, hopefully what I'm going to say is going to be beneficial. So as Angel uh, mentioned, I'm Joshua Edmonds, Director of Digital Inclusion at the City of Detroit. Uh, I started my role at the city at the beginning of 2019. So um, we honestly had a really nice jump start, specifically as it relates to um, organizing our community prior to the pandemic. Uh, and it wasn't like, you know, digital equity and programming wasn't happening in Detroit prior to me, it was. Uh, and I think that my whole role was how do you take um, a very front facing municipal position and galvanize stakeholders accordingly under a larger ecosystem. And so what you'll sometimes hear, uh, if you look more into the work in Detroit, uh, something called Connect 313. So Connect 313 is our um, brand, if you will, that looks at how do we take and this this does ladder up nicely from the previous conversation um industry residents academia community organizations how do you put that under one umbrella and that's essentially what we've been able to do with connect 313 uh we place a high emphasis on our values um i'm not going to go through all of them but one that's been really helpful um for this discussion is uh to our community we say we progress at the speed of trust and trust is one of those uh, elements when we have a digital equity conversation that oftentimes is not on the front end. Usually, you know, people will talk a lot more about um, describing the divide itself, looking at the symptoms of poverty, but there's a there's an um, underlying issue there, and there's a there's a lack of trust in our ecosystem. And so, realistically, what we sought to do was to build something so robust and so bold that we could continue attracting net new resources in perpetuity. So how does that happen? How does that manifest? So since being in my role, we've raised a combined, I'm just gonna approximate this at this point, over $32 million. Um, and a lot of that money is private. We did not have the greatest relationship with the last administration and our governor. So it's not like we could dip into and get a lot of CARES Act funding. A lot of this came from being able to build a model where um, specific interests could be represented. So as we look at some of our founding members of Connect 3 and 3, Microsoft is one of our founding members who's been supporting this work. In addition to Microsoft, Quicken Loans, our nation's largest mortgage um, lender is, is headquartered in Detroit. And so as we begin looking at Quicken Loans, we say to them, how can you hire from this community? Um, how, how do you do that? And that's investments into the, into the digital equity pipeline. So Quicken Loans has been a, a huge support of what we've been able to do. In addition to them, oh, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> in addition, in addition to Quicken Loans, um, we we've been able to even work with our our energy company, uh, our banks, our hospitals. We legitimately built out a board. Um, <laughs> we have our our the Detroit Pistons. Uh, we pretty much said, how do you look at every single actor within the city and not necessarily force them into anything because you don't sustain anything with, you know, off of goodwill. Uh, goodwill is nice. But how do we get people to act within their own self-interest in a way that's tied to this digital inclusion conversation? And so that's essentially how we've been able to operate. And we have our own fund. 
We have a community governance model. We have a way where as soon as residents are saying, hey, I have a suggestion, you all are doing all these great things. You, you know, deployed over 51,000 devices to residents, um, yeah, or, or to students last year, another 30,000 plus to, to residents and seniors. You're doing all this stuff, but I want you to do X or Y in my neighborhood. We're like, good. We have a, a form <laughs> where residents are able to then submit to a larger community body and say, I want this in my neighborhood, and whatever that might be. And I think that what we're getting at, and I, I mentioned this before about the ability to attract new resources, you know, two days ago, uh, a healthcare agency reached out to us, their national one, and said, hey, we see the work that you're doing, we see you have a fund, uh, we would like to deposit $50,000 into your fund. Now, none of us asked for that, that actually just kind of came randomly, and this is where we start getting into the sustainability conversation. How do you build a model that can attract net new resources so we're not constantly cannibalizing our local ones, but at the same time, how do you do that with resident trust? And so we, this is, a, I would say, a digital, digital equity conversation. You know, we started with digital inclusion. Digital inclusion was just getting the people the technology they needed. We then are now in the equity phase where we're distributing resources equitably, where we're getting a better understanding of how to empower people, which then ladders up to, when I already said the word, digital empowerment. How do we go in it from people who are on the front end who are just receiving content to then producing content, eventually getting there? And obviously now not every resident is going to you know, want to take part in that, nor everyone has to do that. But I think that what we're trying to do is set a recipe that is replicable, that is bold, that can attract resources into our community in a way where you know the city isn't just the only entity at the table calling all the shots. We can do this in a way where um, we can do it together while at the same time activating political resources to achieve those those uh, those resource um, the resource allocations that we need. The last piece I'll say, and I'll stop talking after this, um, is <laughs> the emphasis on data. Because yeah, uh, many local governments, many communities, yes, we get it, the American Community Survey, cool. Our thing is, <laughs> you know, we being Detroit and everyone referring to us as that underserved city, um, well, that honestly boils down to uh, the way that data is being defined by uh, how people are defining us related to that data. And I think that what we're trying to do is shift the narrative and get a better data set that allows us then to say, yes, you might refer to us as underserved. We would raise you and say we are critically underserved by way of poverty being a big factor um, that is contributing to our digital divide. So therefore, with that, with that nuanced approach with the data, it allows us to move a bit more agile and have better conversations as it relates to getting the resources we need. And so um, I'm, I'm, I'm probably talking at a very high level, so I apologize if there's, there's a certain things where it seems that, um, oh, I'd like him to go deeper on. I promise you, yes, I will. Uh, I'm just trying to <laughs> be respectful of the other expertise um, from, from the, um, pan my, my co-panelists, but please follow up with, with any questions about what we've been able to do in Detroit. I definitely wanna share more, but thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Um, I'm sure people are gonna have a lot of uh, follow-up reaction once we get to that, that point. Um, now let's hear from our, our next panelist. Um, Ms. Hernandez, are you, are you here with us? I am, thank you. Okay. Hi, so I gotta say, I am feeling a little bit out of my depth here, <laughs> but I'm very excited um, to hear from all of the panelists today and also dig into the research that's been highlighted. Um, so I'm Senia Hernandez. I am actually originally from Phoenix, Arizona, but I've been in St. Paul, Minnesota for almost seven years now. Um, and I'm with the, St. Paul Public Library. I am a library community services coordinator and I manage our entrepreneur workforce and technology support services. And this includes a couple of creative and learning spaces. Um, so as the library, we support and help promote our city's economic development programs. But where we really shine is in creating welcoming and inclusive spaces where our residents can come in and find the information that they need, but also get the technical support and the language support um, to actually apply for those programs and all of those resources. So with COVID, this really has changed our outreach um, in that you know we have to contact our folks through Google Hangout or WhatsApp or just making calls all the time. But really our overall approach has been hyper-local, user-centered and hands-on. Um, so, um, 
I'll talk about two spaces. So first we have the Workforce and Innovation Center. This is located in downtown St. Paul. Um, we opened about four years ago, and this is really a maker space for adult job seekers, entrepreneurs, and creative professionals. And I say adult here because maker spaces tend to be for teens in different cities, but we really took this approach um, to help support folks that really need a little more access, a little bit more handholding. And we use a membership model. Membership is free. We are the library after all, um, but you have access to equipment with the library. And this equipment uh, includes laser engravers, sewing machines, uh, recording studio equipment, podcasting equipment, media equipment. So all of those things that typically you'd have to pay for elsewhere, you have for free in our space. Um, our biggest lesson in all of these years is that the social connection is really the most important piece here. Connecting entrepreneurs to each other, job seekers to each other makes the biggest difference. Um, of course, in COVID, this changed. And so how did this change? Um, we actually, because we have a lot of talented staff in libraries, we were called um, from the mayor's office, from funding and economic development, from the Office of Financial Empowerment to kind of provide that user um, experience to provide information on how to connect with our residents. Um, and we did this in a few ways. We actually helped stand up call centers to um, to support some COVID relief programs um, in different languages. We also stood up four career labs in partnership with our Ramsey County. Um, and this was funded by CARES Act. Um, and we opened up four spaces where we very intentionally were focusing on areas that were in critical need. So these are folks that are already experiencing, I know someone earlier in the day said, there's, these are just normal disparities. These are folks who are experiencing the everyday disparities, but now there's a pandemic on top of that. Um, they're more likely to be health, their health is more likely to be impacted by the pandemic. And then of course their economic standing is more likely to be impacted by the pandemic. So we opened up these four spaces to really help uh, the workforce connect to technology and again to people. Um, the, the way that it all played out is a little bit unique. We, it's different for libraries because there were a lot of restrictions. One, people had to tell us, yes, I have been impacted by COVID-19. And that turns out is a very tricky question. <laughs> um, people don't like to answer it or there's a lot of other issues going on and, and answering that question actually proves to be quite tough. Um, but we learned how to work around that and still connect people to the support that they needed. Um, and then one specific program that came out of this is the Tech Pack program where we were able to actually connect people to laptops and to hotspots and hand them over. It wasn't a checkout thing. It's like, no, you get the hotspot and it's yours to keep. This is the computer for you to keep. Um, so I'm saying all of that to get to this. Uh, one of our biggest lessons here is that yes, social connection is important. Yes, access is important, but direct, direct support, direct financial support, direct support with physical equipment with with um, cash funds is actually really important. And so now what we're looking at is really expanding our workforce and innovation center and taking that approach by supporting our entrepreneurs and supporting our uh, job seekers with micro grants. Um, so now that is the next phase of our expansion, but we've really come to this conclusion through our COVID experience. Um, and I know that's um, a lot of little different things um, that may seem disconnected. And believe me, I've been struggling with how to connect all of them. Um, but that is where we are in, in St. Paul Public Library. Um, and we continue to work with our larger city um, to provide all of those lessons learned. And I'm happy to answer more questions. Thank you very much, Senya. Uh, we are now gonna give time to our third panelist, um, Christine McCabe the Director of Economic Development with uh, our wonderful city of Phoenix here. Please, the floor is yours. Thanks, thanks so much for having me here today. So uh, again, as you said, Chris Mackey, the Director of Economic Development here for the city of Phoenix, a 25 year economic developer in this community. So I've seen the community go from really being more of a farm burg up into this thriving, you know, crazy cool tech city. And I probably learned more over the last year 
than I learned in my previous 24 years in, in economic development. So, um, you know, much like Ms. Hernandez is talking about in her community and her library, we have similar assets. We have what's called the Hive within our Burton Bar Library and at several of our other libraries where entrepreneurs can come in, they can gain access to resources and connections and to human capital and to technology and working with each other. In fact, Hive has spun out about 94, to date about 94 entrepreneurial companies uh, within our market. Uh, we have our maker space. I also oversee the Business and Workforce Center where businesses come in for, for hiring and for connections. And I say all that to, to, to say, you know, what, what Joshua and, and, and Mr. Hernandez have been speaking of are incredible things that are happening in all of our market. But I'd like to go a little bit of a different route, and that's more focusing on our businesses. And really what I'm embarrassed to tell you, I learned about our businesses this last year, and then being able to talk to you about how we're working to change that and to provide assistance. So Phoenix is a city of 1.7 million people. We're 517 square miles. So just the city of Phoenix, not greater Phoenix, but just the city itself is half the size of the state of Rhode Island. So we're a really, really large landmass city that's made up of 13 different villages and 13 different employment corridors. And each one of them really has their own personality. And some of them are, are, are much more lower on the socioeconomic scale um, and in inclusion than other parts of the city. And so as the pandemic, you know, our city's been a thriving city. It does incredibly well. We help all of our businesses. We have about 120,000 businesses here in the city of Phoenix. About 22,000 of them employ five or more people. And the balance of them, about 100,000 are solopreneurs. They're kind of mom and pop shops. They're, they're more, uh, they're older businesses that have been around for quite some time. As we went into the pandemic and the entire, you know, the entire community, virtually the entire country came to a screeching halt the city of Phoenix launched a, a grant program, a COVID grant program to, to Mr. Hernandez's point, um, it, we, that, that idea of getting money out and getting capital out into the market to help our businesses stay alive. My team at the council's direction ran those grants and about $15 million in grants was dispersed over an eight month period of time to our, to our businesses. And it was our small businesses that got the money, 25 employees or less. But as we were doing our, our grants, as we would, the information would come back in, as we would do the analysis on the application, it became incredibly evident that the businesses that were making application for the grant were those businesses that had connection to computers. Without thinking about what we were doing, we made the application an online application where businesses had to go and log online, submit for, uh, you know, submit gross receipts, show the loss that they had from COVID, tell us about their business, submit what they needed from the application, submit their W-9. All of this information was done online. And as we started analyzing the data, we realized there were two distinct council districts that, this, uh, that any applications were being left out of. And they were our, our council districts that are predominantly council districts of color. There are smaller businesses, there are older businesses, and we couldn't figure out why. So we did more social media marketing. We did more outreach into those particular areas and still crickets. Um, to Joshua's point, it was, a, it was a twofold. It was a trust factor and the trust of the government. You know, if you are trying to give me money, there's clearly strings that are attached to it that we don't want to connect with. And number two, we weren't trying to connect to them in the method in which they like to accept information or that they're prepared to accept information. And it really rose to me in uh, about August of last year, how much of those two council districts of our businesses of color that don't do any operations in a digital media at all. They're still in a paper media, they're cash businesses, they're not in social media, they don't have an online presence, they don't have email, they don't read you know, they don't read their newspapers online. They're still, still very tactile. They're doing their businesses with their surrounding communities by word of mouth, by local advertising, by much more traditional methods. And so we started leveraging through the council districts 
um, with the with those businesses and going out to those businesses, even in a COVID environment, they were operating in their businesses. So we would mask up, we'd socially distance, but we would go out and start to work with those businesses. And again, I'll go to Joshua's point. The trust factor was, I'm embarrassed to say a 25 year economic developer, the, the amount of distrust of my team walking into their businesses and trying to provide assistance was, um, was incredible. Uh, it really made me look deep inside myself as an economic developer and really rethink how we connect to our businesses. So those businesses that knew how to find us that could log on, could log on their applications, could get the information, were getting all the money. We're getting ready to launch a new program as we, of course, as we get all of our, our second round of stimulus funding to help our businesses, we're launching a new grant application. And in those two council districts that are more businesses of color, we are now, we've uh, created a team that are team members from the community that they know, they know themselves well. They're gonna have tablets in their hand. They're gonna go out and work with the companies, fill out their applications for them. We're connecting through their places of worship. We're connecting through their community areas. We're connecting through the places where they want to be connected to because it is, it's important that we get out. Those are our businesses that need the help the most. And just because they don't have the exact documentation that we need in the method in which we need it, we have I've spent the last, you know, kind of the last six months of figuring out what well, we didn't know, what we didn't know. My, my special projects administrator over our grant program likes to say that we were building the fire truck while we were training the firefighters, while we were putting out the fire from the time that the CARES Act funding was released in everybody. And she's not kidding. That's exactly what was happening. But as, you know, we dispersed the last of our funds in, in October, November, and we started to think about what we could have done better and if we got more money, what we would do. And so we're going to bring on uh, 10 temporary employees from those two communities, people that they trust, people that they already know, people that are already with their businesses that can go out and make those connections to the businesses. But what I found fascinating was, uh, was how those businesses, when you start talking to them, uh, the way they want to be communicated to about e-commerce, about social media, about driving more business to their business, about marketing, um, there really is a connection there that I am super excited uh, over the next year to, and, and Joshua, I'd love to connect with you and find out what you've been doing as the, in your digital platforms and being able to help these companies and kind of learn from your best practices. We connected with a local group that uh, it's called Cahoots and they are, uh, we've contracted with them and are running a, a digital media platform, but also a physical presence platform to get out to those businesses where we can. We've already connected with 400 businesses uh, that are, we're providing that information back to them the way that they like it. So uh, again, you know, here we have this, this great big city who is, you know, for all intents and purposes seems to know what it's doing, but I can tell you, I learned as I started out with, I've learned more about our businesses and the digital divide that exists not only within our educational system, but that digital challenge that exists with all of our businesses in the last year more than I'd ever thought that I would learn before. So excited to take your questions and to uh, learn from each other in, in, this, in this program. So thanks. I want to encourage the panelists uh, to engage with each other on any of the important issues or interesting issues that that, uh, that came up, but uh, perhaps to inspire a bit of dialogue, uh, maybe we could talk more about the issue of trust. Um, Ms. Mackey, you, you made uh, a very important sort of uh, point with respect to the importance of trust uh, in the new uh, you know, COVID environment and development um, efforts. Are there other cities that, that perhaps um, the city of Phoenix is learning from? Uh, are there existing models of, of, that, that provide evidence about the role of trust? And, and maybe the other panelists can talk about this, this issue as well. You know, that's a, that's a really good question. And it is, and, and it's a different on areas of trust as we move around kind of depending on which, you know, which you're trying to, to actually um, work through, whether it's our businesses or education. So, you know, a lot of people may or may not know Arizona, of course, this kind of wild west mentality. Um, until I was much older here in Phoenix, 
I did not realize the bright line, the bright red line that used to exist here in Phoenix on a very specific street where people of color were not allowed to purchase a house north of that particular street back in the 30s and 40s and 50s. And we are in our, particularly in our communities of color, we're a very, very generational um, community. We've got people who are fifth and sixth generation, where if you go to Caucasian population, if you ask people, you ask 100 people in the room to raise their hand if they're a native, I'm probably the only one. And so it is, uh, it is our, our communities of color have memories that have been passed through from generation that deal with that trust and deal with how the government had let them down time and time and time again. You know, I will, and not because he's here on the call with us, I will tell you Detroit is one of the areas that we look to in that community trust. And it is because of Quicken Loans. Quicken Loans has a tremendous presence here in downtown Phoenix as well, and is really engaged with the city. And as we talk to their senior leadership, they talk about how, you know, that they, how they worked with the, with the city of Detroit, how they work with the communities, how they brought people back into the central city of the community by building the trust, by building home ownership, by building that connection back to the community. So again, I would, it, whether Joshua was on the call or not, I would say that that is one that as we've looked how to, to build the, the, the faith of the community back with the government and back with business, that's one we look to. And I'd, I'd be interested in Joshua's position with Quicken and Loan, with Quicken Loans and how he worked with their executive leadership on his programs. Well, I'll definitely say on the on the trust piece, um, and and yes, Chris, I'm going to answer your questions because I I want to, but I'm like on the trust piece. Um, I I think the 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 big thing that keeps coming up um, is kind of like back taxes we have to pay, and I don't necessarily mean that in like the taxation sense. I I literally mean when you have a great intervention. Um, let's say you wanted to get everybody in your city technology, you wanna have a completely Wi-Fi accessible city, great, good job. The problem is if you're looking at historically when consumer internet really you know, first became a thing, like you know, mid late nineties, um, you know, it wasn't like a concentrated effort to get everybody online. <laughs> it was kind of marketing it to the people who cared about it. And we didn't really deviate or change from that style. And so fast forward to the pandemic, and obviously um, I'm, I'm summarizing in some senses because you had had you know, many coalitions who have been successful in building that community trust, but collectively, I don't think that we've built really great support structures for our communities in a way when it comes to technology. So now Usher and people now who have really, really great intentions, um, and they have great intentions today, <laughs> but there's years and years of people being forgotten and then us trying to make the intervention now. It's very difficult to make up that ground and stagger. These, you're, now you're going at psyche and then people's mentality. And so I, I you know, am very cognizant of the political realities and shortfalls in our legacy cities. And I think that whenever we're trying to do our work, we can be so well-intentioned and it still goes off the rails. Like, man, what is this? And it's like, well, it's because of that historic lens and we, we have to use that for our work. Now on the quick and loans piece and even out uh, them specifically, you know, I remember when I first came into Detroit, I had a very terrifying experience. Um, <laughs> my first day in the job, I get introduced to the mayor's cabinet, which that was fine. I wasn't, I wasn't, that wasn't, that was cool. But one hour later, they threw me in front of the cameras and said, all right, <laughs> He's the vision. He's the, he's the reason why we're going to have, you know, internet everywhere. He's the tech answer for Detroit. And that, that was like one of the headlines. I was so angry at that headline because I was like, one, like, I don't have a budget because again, that's the reality. If you are, you know, an urban core and even rural cores too. I mean, it's not like there's robust funding specifically for digital equity, digital empowerment or any of that. Like, no, you got to get creative with that. And so at that time, my first day in the job, I didn't know anyone and I had no budget. And so I'm staring in front of the camera and, you know, I just told them like, hey, you know, there's money in Detroit and we're going to make Detroit the national model for digital inclusion. And I like that was a genuine belief. Um, and I'm not necessarily saying I don't believe that now, but at the time, that was a genuine belief. Now, how does that ladder up? That level of boldness and articulating that, well, that kind of got some of the attention from some of our other executives um, in some of our corporations, one being quick and loan. So they're like, well, OK, you have this bold vision. How can we help? And I think that that's where uh, I would 
really, really implore other folks who are looking to get more industry involved to be able to empower people to get involved. So it's one thing to be able to point to and say, yes, we have this horrible digital divide and you can skew it whatever way you want to make the case for why they need to get involved. It'd be okay, you have to do that. But being able to carve out a, a place for them specifically and then do the same for every partner, that's what we did. So when I was talking to Quicken Loans, it's, hey Quicken, you all have a, a, a really big presence. You have done a lot of great work in the community. This is another initiative that we have to tackle and we can't do it without you. And I think, you know, really making it that <laughs> plain and clear that resonated with them. And so um, last year we were doing a golf tournament. It was a Rocket Mortgage Classic. And they used that fundraising to then dump into our digital inclusion work, which is another $2.7 million. That then has them saying, how else can we lean in? How else? Okay, we're doing this or that. We Last year we did a commercial with Aquaman or Jason Momoa um, and we toured the city of Detroit and that was an awareness campaign. And so I think that what I've been doing for them um, and what I've been doing with a lot of our partners is carving out lanes for them to be empowered, opposed to just leaving them at the front end of the conversation, which is we have this really bad digital divide <laughs> and these are a few cities that are doing things like, no, 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 no. This is what I specifically need you and only you for. And doing that every single time has been very helpful. I'll stop talking, but I will say the other cities that are worth looking into who are doing great work, obviously the cities who are already represented on this call, but in addition to my native of Cleveland, Ohio, um, they've been working in a way where they don't really have the city administration buy-in as much as they would like, but they're doing a really great job working around. In addition, Baltimore Mayor Scott has announced that they're hiring a director of digital inclusion, um, for which, yes, I'm very happy about that. Uh, Charlotte with Digital Charlotte, obviously they you know, have a really strong coalition. Um, Miami is ramping up their efforts. Um, I've seen some things, obviously Chicago um, and San Jose, every time I mention any of these discussions, I'm always gonna drop San Jose. So Joshua, you know, just dovetailing on what you were just talking about. So Dominic Papa is on the phone uh, on this meeting as well with, with the Arizona Commerce Authority. So back in May, to your point, um, on the on the digital divide issue, Dominic and, and led by Councilwoman Laura Pastor, we brought together our educational institutions, our business, economic development, the government, as we have the central city where, you know, pandemic happened. If you were, you know, you had internet at home for your kids, your kids' education was virtually, dis virtually not disrupted. They learned online. It was cumbersome, but they did it. Where in the central city, we've got 93% of our kids on free and reduced lunch. And there, you know, they didn't have internet access at home. And so th there were five of us that led from the business community, from the state, from the city, from our community college, and from our, our union high school district that got together to come up with a solution, putting money together, cobbling funding together. So that was kind of our, that's one of our entry paths of our hope into starting to break through on that trust issue is starting with the younger generation as well. You, you made the comment that it's, you know, it's generational, it's been around for, for this time, but breaking through at the, at the student level to be able to, to provide our students, even in the communities where their parents have never had internet or their businesses don't have internet, but the children will, and they'll be able to connect to their schools. They'll be able to be just like, you know, all of the other kids that can do their homework at home. We are, our micro proof of concept is standing up as we speak. In fact, if I looked out the window, I could, I could, and with my binoculars, I could see the top of the rooftop of the school where it's going in right now. But that was that exactly what you said. Our councilwoman went to each individual and said, this is what I specifically need you for. I don't need you for anything else, but I need you to do this thing. And, and Dominic and I got sucked into her vortex and um, have been helping her with that since, since last May. And it has come to fruition. It will be, uh, it, it's one that we, we've figured out a way to do it cheaper. Than, than others have been able to figure out, but, but broadcasting on a broader distance. And that's kind of that point is moving in at our younger level to start to break that distrust. I'd like to chime in. And I do see Karen's questions. Do, do libraries have advantages for trust in the community? Um, yes, if we are intentional uh, about it. So at St. Paul Public Library, we, it's been a few years, but we've been very intentional in hiring community specialists. Um, and these are folks that have the same lived experiences as the communities that they're going to be connecting with. So 
Black community specialists, Somali community specialists, Oromo community specialists, Hmong, Karen, et cetera. Um, and it's not so much about the reading and the writing, it's like a little, the language and again, the experience. Um, St. Paul is a very diverse capital city. We've got 300,000 residents, um, significant Hmong, Hispanic, Somali, and Karen populations. And a lot of those are refugee population. So not just your typical immigrant uh, families. Um, and it takes a lot of trust and a lot of face time to help people through some of the basics, um, not just accessing um, technology, but even helping people sign up for a COVID test or vaccine registration. Like you, we are working through a lot of pieces. It's not just lack of technology, it's trauma with the health system. And for some people, it is trauma with the technology. There are folks that are coming here from governments that didn't allow them to have technology that was illegal for them. So there are lots of these layers going on and it's been really critical for us in St. Paul to have our community specialists to help families work through that. Um, and then again, this is one of the reasons that we are often called by our partner departments to support special programs to help make those connections to make sure that we are reaching those communities through our existing networks through all of that trust building a trust network <laughs> and, and and i will add to um uh, karen karen's question around the libraries for trust and, and that was a very very intentional answer that was just given um so i appreciate the nuance um that that, that you're using um the uh you know when you look at and this thing the same thing extends to the technology partners as just what was mentioned um you have certain people who have been sent to collections over past due bills um and that has came from in some cases libraries that has came from internet providers <laughs> that has came from a variety of sources and so when we'll point to something that makes strategic sense you have the perfect strategy in the world, but those are the things that keep manifesting that are so prickly and we cannot ignore them. And so it's, it's yes, I think for multiple people, it is safe to say that libraries have significantly more trust than other institutions. Absolutely, yes. And we need to be leveraging them to the max. At the same time, we have to be cognizant of the narrative that exists behind them sometimes by them serving as many people as they have been serving that there are certain people who are going to have bad experiences in these spaces. And what we have to do is diversify our community technology assets in a way where it just cannot all fall on the library because some communities do that and that's not really fair to the library either. Um, the yes, they, they are you know, responsible, they'll do the intake, they'll take in residence, they'll answer whatever question you have, they are there for you. But at the same time, I think that we have to do a really, really intentional job of saying, how do we support you all libraries? And that specifically looks like, how do we diversify intake? How do we look at other structures within our communities and then route people accordingly to them in addition to supporting the libraries that way? And I, I want to be very intentional about that because I, again, I just don't think, I don't think it's fair <laughs> to put all that pressure on the library system. Um, I, I think that we had to do a better job. And I think that's what we're committed to doing in, in Detroit by rolling out a, uh, neighborhood technology hub network, uh, looking at um, existing community spaces and some spaces that should be community spaces and repurposing those spaces to be exactly that. And so I just wanna be very clear with that, but I'm not necessarily taking away from the library's role, rather profoundly aware of their role and saying we can do that more by way of investing in a larger infrastructure that puts them at the middle while we then have other support systems surrounding them. Thank you. I'm actually surprised to hear anyone say that. <laughs> they follow us. Um, and I do see Anna's comments. Um, we are, as libraries, we do handle services that should fall on others. Um, it should be a bigger approach. Um, and a lot of our efforts do tend to be Band-Aid efforts. That's the same with if we're just providing laptops to a thousand people. If we're only providing business support in these languages, it, 
it's limiting. It really is. Um, and this is where connecting to the greater city, the state, our national partners, connecting to all of you on this call is really, really important for us to even know who to have that conversation with, who to like really poke at and say like, hey, this is going on. So again, where I see my role, our role um, as library staff is really to continue to support the people in front of us, the people that we um, go to see in the park, at the laundromat, at community events, um, and do what we can for the user there, making sure that we're, we're keeping those information connections alive, making sure we're keeping that trust alive. Um, but we do end up being a Band-Aid uh, for a lot of services. And I'd love to hear more <laughs> what other approaches there are, Christine. Um, Oh, and I do want to say shout out to Detroit and Phoenix and St. Paul because we are all fine free uh, with libraries. So none of our residents should expect any collection bills. <laughs> but I, I'd love to hear um, from Christina or Joshua some of those approaches, some of the, the bigger things that we can tap into without necessarily taking on, taking on ourselves. All right, I was waiting. <laughs> I was waiting. <laughs> I, honestly, I think that, like, you know, there's, I think our role, and I guess the role of the municipality in this sense, um, has really been on orchestrating opportunities um, and just being very clear on that piece. So, like, when you hear me saying, like, oh, the library doesn't take on that stress or whatever, it's because I'm trying to think about this in a way of, okay, if I'm an ecosystem, what makes the most sense for sustainability sake? So how do we, again, keep attracting net new resources while at the same time, how, how do we become profoundly aware of the pitfalls and challenges from these legacy organizations like our libraries, like our rec centers, et cetera. And so I, I you know, I, I hate that I'm gonna mention something so, <laughs> it's, it's so like tactical, but like eh, we're, we're already well beyond this, but, when we first started looking at doing like that technology lending, um, that was something that I remember um, when I was in Cleveland, we worked with Cle Cleveland Public Library on that as well as the county library system. Um, and, you know, it's been over you know, 2,000 2, hotspots uh, that have been added. Now they've added laptops and they just keep adding technology to that. And one of the things on the back end that works really well is, you know, they have a really great refurbisher there and PCs for people. And in Detroit, what we also, you know, have been able to do is that technology lending um, and we're scaling up to do that. But on the back end, when I was talking to my library, they're like, look, we don't have the ability to essentially manage an entire circulatory system that you're adding on top of what we're already doing. And if something breaks, like we can't do that. You want us to do tech support. We really can't do that. We don't have the staffing for that. And that's where I said, no, 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 no. You don't have to worry about that. Like we have an entire coalition of partners and organizations to then take like to, to take the weight off of you a bit. And so we work locally with a national entity called Human IT. Um, they are a refurbisher and they, you know, provide the tech support for one, not only the school district children, but in addition to the other devices that we're, de we're deploying. As we're ramping up with our library, I just want to say, what are all the things that you all are thinking about <laughs> and how can we begin taking things off your plate so you don't have to own? And so I you know, want our ecosystem to be as responsive as possible to our anchor institutions. And I, I apologize because it is such a juvenile and elementary example, um, but that is the example that I can point to that serves as a proof of concept for the ways that ecosystems of scale can take care of each other in a really unique way. So we're just saying like, hey, you all have your challenges, we have a body that is there to support those. What else are they? And so even on one other side of what we've been able to do, so I've mentioned that we have a fund that does internalize grant making within the city. So any resident, again, who has an idea or suggestion, whatever, we have a fund that is there to support that. But in addition, we also have a grant seeking component within our larger ecosystem. And we work with Wayne State University. So every single time there is a national, federal, statewide grant that can go to one of our partners, we have people on the clock operationalized looking at the next opportunities. And so when we did telehealth last year um, in December, um, uh, we got about $4 million from the state for that. That was us applying from our local ecosystem. The city didn't apply for that. That, that applied through Connect 313. 
And so as you're seeing IMLS funding, you're seeing additional ways that libraries can be involved. We have an ecosystem that we can just route dollars accordingly. <laughs> and that allows us to be significantly smarter and it's an easier lift rather than you know 60 different organizations all submitting <laughs> for something and fighting amongst each other. Like, no, we can be smarter about this. And I think that's the approach that we're getting to. We want to scale and replicate that as much as possible because it has made our work here a lot easier. It's still very difficult, but it's easier in the ways that it should be easy, which is we don't necessarily have to wait when a funder says, well, what does the community think? It's like, well, no, <laughs> like this is community decision-making. So we don't have to worry about that. And we also don't have to worry too much about, um, well, is the library involved? Is this, are they involved? Are they involved? Like people always ask those typical questions like, well, no, everyone's already at the table. And so I just think that we're trying to be a faster operation while being cognizant and responsive to the, to the needs of our anchor institutions and our residents probably. Well, then if it, so uh, uh, it's Chris Mackey. Um, so I always look at everything. I'm an economic developer. So I look at things through the lens of a business. That's my, that's my role within the city is to look at those lenses that way. So when we looked at, you know, when with, with honest question, uh, with honest statement about our, our refugee population, that's something that we work closely with. So, um, you know, as individuals are coming in, as they find resources and services here and they move forward, we, uh, particularly in Council District 4, we have um, 46 different languages spoke within a one mile of one particular intersection in the city of Phoenix. So what we did was we partnered with an organization, Local First, and created the World Bazaar. And we, what we do is within the, the area where, uh, where the community is, it's right off of light rail, we uh, use our, our um, park and rides on the weekend and create a World Bazaar where they can sell their goods and sell their wares. Well, they're, they're doing so well that a number of them have actually been able working, then working with our team, we, we can help them find funding through Kiva, through crowdfunding, through other methods to find funding to put up a traditional bricks and mortar uh, a business, not a large scale, but a small scale business. And then I, of course, work closely with all of the, you know, tens of millions of square feet of retail space and office space and industrial space that's across the city of Phoenix. And so what I do is I call those business owners and their vacant suites that they have, I'll rotate through and leverage them providing for free space where in the summer, in the spring and the summer, our refugee businesses can do pop-up markets within their vacant space. Well, it's a win-win. It's drawing people into their businesses and their retail establishments to see what's going on and to take advantage of some of the assets that are there. So, you know, and, and with, with honest question about how they, they came to everyone, it, there's no one typical, they all came here in a different manner. We work through our organizations to be able to provide that same economic development support for our refugee businesses as we do for businesses that are, are, have been here for long term in the city of Phoenix and leveraging whatever resources that we have here to be able to partner uh, with them as well. And, and what we're finding is it's really turning Phoenix into a better city, a much more inclusive city and a city that's now being thought of as a much more internationally sophisticated place than just a place that does business in the US. So we're finding by, by helping all of our businesses, it's making Phoenix a much better place to do business. And I, I there's there was something that you you um you know said that I think um I would like to see other communities do a bit more of, and that is to like there there was a bold vision that you all articulated, and you're 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 acting on that. So you're saying, hey, you know, we're, we're transforming Phoenix and there's this global implication now to it opposes. And, and, and that is exactly kind of um, the necessary ingredient when we begin talking about this digital equity, digital inclusion, digital empowerment, or whatever you want to, economic development too, fine. We'll, we'll, we'll add it all in there, but it's like that bold articulation sometimes is what's missing. So you have a lot of practitioners who unfortunately have been molded by scarcity. So for on the digital inclusion conversation, we're so used to not having, um, and this is from the practitioner side, not even the residential, I mean, obviously, but on the practitioner side, we're so used to not having that when you're given the opportunity and someone finally gives you the mic, it's like, uh, <laughs> and then you stumble or you don't know what to say, or you're not bold enough. And, and you know, I've gone on the record and, you know, told other cities that we talked to them, look, 
If this is a $50 million problem or $500 million problem, then articulate it as such. Make that vision that bold and clear instead of going the, the bootstrapping that we have historically done. And I'm throwing myself into that too, because there are certain times when you know there's huge asks that could be made. You're seeing this Rescue Act right now. This is the most money that has ever been allocated for digital inclusion. And if we get this wrong, this will be the most money that ever will be allocated because they're not going to do it again. And so this is the point where we have a real uh, defining moment as cities, as communities, as a country to say, okay, fine, let us treat the, the digital divide with the level of boldness and gravitas that it deserves. And let's articulate a bolder vision that can actually transform our cities. And so in, in Detroit, when you know, I'm saying, oh, let's make it the national model or whatever. Okay. There was some bravado in that, I admit. However, <laughs> that was one of the, the ingredients that got the people involved in a way that's saying, yeah, let, let, let's get on board with that. Let's do that. And so I, you know, one, and I guess to, to, to the other, you know, folks who are representing other communities to really push that as, as much as possible and say, like, look, now's the time to be bold. Maybe 10 years ago, it would have been great to be, uh, and maybe people weren't, or maybe they were, they just weren't being heard. But now is literally the time <laughs> to start re-envisioning things and be a bit bolder because that's what it's going to take. And if we're not like that, then we miss the mark, not just with funding for today, but every other dollar that's in the pipeline that potentially could be used if we were only so bold to, to, to articulate that. We have about uh, 10 minutes left and uh, Karen has a great question here. And I think it's, it's a great way for us to, um, to spend the last few minutes. Uh, local governments are in such an important position for leadership on digital equity and inclusive opportunity. Um, but intergovernmental support is needed. What do you need from state and federal government? So I'll, I don't mind jumping in first on this one because this is something we're working on so closely now with our digital divide and, and the intergovernmental agreements that we have between all of our agencies where we're bringing everyone in to help with that solution. I think the, I think again, economic developer and as, as Joshua said, you know, I'm bold. That, that is, that's the only thing I ever know how to be is bold because if I don't make bold asks, nobody will ever, will always just limp along. And so I make bold asks on a constant basis. I think part of what we need uh, from, from the state and federal, and the state in our, in our intergovernmental agreement is intimately involved, Dom Dominic's on the, the line with us, and his agency is intimately involved with us in our, in our digital inclusion. But on the federal government side, you got to pull off the rails. We don't need bumpers that tell us where we have to go and how we have to do it and how we can use the money. We're at the local level. We're where the rubber meets the pavement. We know what needs to be done. And you need to just let us do it and be responsible for the funding once it gets to us or the opportunity gets to us that we're going to implement it the way that our specific community needs and our population needs that doesn't fit in some cookie cutter role. Thank you. Oh, man, I mean, I, man, how much, I know you said 10 minutes, but my goodness, I mean, <laughs> This, this, this is not only a fantastic question because it embodies probably so much the frustration <laughs> that I have. I'll just say this. One, you know, Michigan, we don't have a state broadband office. And that has been infuriating. That has been so frustrating. If someone's you know, going to watch this in retrospect and see every panel that I've been on since whatever, I've mentioned this on every single call. I am that angry now where it is. Oh, uh, yeah. So. By us not having this, let me tell you what we lose. We lose a coordinated cosigner. And what I mean by that, when I was trying to build community <laughs> with industry partners and raise the money that I needed to raise, and we still have ways to go in that, it was very difficult not having that cosigner in the room that says, yes, this is also priority at the, governor, at, at the governor's level. When you don't have that, you're hustling. And so when I talk about that scarcity mindset, what contributes to that scarcity mindset is a lack of being co-signed. And so the, the state has a really critical role that they can play in co-signing the local efforts in their community that then can activate philanthropy, that then can activate academia. The state has, a, has the ability, as a local municipality says, 
we want to do this bold thing. The state is over that and saying, and this is how we're going to get it done. And this is how we're going to support you. We don't have that. And that is, I'm, I used to have a lot of hair and I pulled it all out because uh, I've been so frustrated with my state. The second piece on the federal government part, I don't know about you all, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's going great in Washington with the, 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 the resources we see coming. It's fantastic. But the problem is when you have national organizations who are doing their best to communicate those messages to us, it gets lost. They're, they're, they're taking in this information at the national level and they're speaking in, in, at the national level. Locally, how these things manifest, I'll give you a great example. The emergency broadband benefit. Glad that's a thing. I'm glad to see it happening. But my thing is, you go to any one of your local communities and say, are you signed up for the emergency broadband benefit? No one even knows what that is. What? No one, There are people who literally say, hey, look, I don't care about broadband. I just want internet. And I'm like, wait, isn't that? Okay, never mind. I see terminology. And so this is where, at the local level, <laughs> we have to be much more in front of both our state and federal levels as these things are getting articulated, because this is where all this work is going to manifest and materialize. And so there is a back tax, again, that the federal government has to pay, again, not from a, a monetary perspective, but for so long saying that, well, we only you know, care about these communities and they might not necessarily say, well, we never said that. Well, the way you invested definitely said that. And so now that they want to say, well, we want to invest in communities broadly, we want to get broadband to everybody. Well, for so long, you all have been absent in this equation. And so you left us to our own devices or the lack thereof, and now we're speaking in different terms, and now we're miscommunicating things. And so the federal government, the state government, and the local government have to be aligned. And when they're not aligned, one of us goes really far off and does all these great things, and then yet we're still playing catch up with the government. It is a terrible, terrible model. We have to fix it. Any community that has that alignment between the local, the state, and the federal government they are doing it right. And if you don't have that, you're going to continuously limping, limp alone, even though it's no fault of your own. And so, yes, you can tell I'm passionate about this. I'll stop talking. But yes, that alignment has to happen. Zinnia, do you want to chime in? Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, at the local level, we, I mean, okay, this has just been a struggle um, just to have people take ownership or like any entity take ownership of the problem has been a huge challenge, a big barrier. It just keeps getting bounced around or there's like one year solutions and nothing long-term. Um, but at the local level, at the city level, we are, the libraries at the table at the conversation, we are actually working on a digital blueprint pathway conversation now. And I hope it goes somewhere. I'm not um, leading that charge, but it is difficult and i think what we need most is just a solid aligned vision i mean i'm totally connecting with what joshua is saying right now is just it's so lacking right now um we do have an office of broadband but when you go visit the site there's not much there um so yeah that's what i would <laughs> look for i'm not um as as knowledgeable about that about that area but if it existed, I think I'd know about it by now. And notice I said of no fault of, of anyone's own. So even if you're not knowledgeable, ex that's exactly why that's an issue. Like you're legitimately doing this work in an anchor institution in your community. And like, <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. I It bothers me so much because it's, it's not even a very difficult thing to do. It's like, let's just use more nuance. <laughs> like, can we at least look at where we're falling short at every single level and then right those wrongs accordingly. Like someone had asked me, well, Josh, were you not galvanized by the, the national broadband plan? I'm like, no, 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 I was not. No, I don't know who was. <laughs> so that's something where I think there's a really unique opportunity for us to voice our concerns, do the best we can. Yes, we can sit on federal boards. Um, I think that that gives us good enough insight, but there definitely needs to be an overhaul on the way that we frame this conversation and the way that we're able to sync because it's not happening. And the longer it doesn't happen, the more folks at libraries and folks at economic development institutions are having to bootstrap it on the ground and find nuance and creative ways when <laughs> the most obvious ways are right in front of us. Thank you, Josh. And um, I wanna thank all, all three of you for a fantastic panel. I think that this was um, an amazing way to wrap up the event. 
uh, you've definitely highlighted a variety of very important issues um, that are unfolding at uh, a variety of different levels of government. Um, 